Hey everybody, I'm Samurai Sam. Welcome to part two of my Nintendo DS collection. We are going through the bottom of these two rows. The first time uh, we did the top row, so now we're doing the bottom row. And um, I guess we might as well just get right to it. Let's start out here with... Uh, actually, I should probably stick from this side. I think the lighting's better. Yeah, probably. Uh, Mario & Luigi Partners in Time. So Mario & Luigi is a series of, uh, I guess, non-traditional JRPG, sort of. Um, where, like, I mean, I've already talked about this a little bit because of the first one on GBA, but um, you control both Mario and Luigi, and Mar Mario's typically represented with the A button, Luigi with the B button and stuff, and, um, like, you can, like, jump in battle and stuff and dodge enemy attacks, and it's really cool, it's fun. Uh, and this one has um, Baby Mario and Baby Luigi, uh, thanks to time travel, as also as playable party members, that sometimes, I think sometimes all four of them are in the same battle, I think that happens a lot. Um, I haven't played through this one since, like, it first came out, pretty much, but I definitely enjoyed it a lot. It wasn't, like... I don't know, I can't, I don't like remember it super well, but I mean, it, it's just a good solid fun game, good sense of humor, lots of funny dialogue. Uh, there's a couple of Hammer Brothers that speak in, leak speak in this game, and that was quite amusing. Um, yeah, it's a fun game. I mean, if you like Superstar Saga, then, you know, play this one too. There's no reason not to, really. And uh, another one, uh, Mario Luigi, Bowser's Inside Story. My nose is so itchy right now. Ah. Bowser's Inside Story. So, um, another Mario Luigi game. This one actually has Bowser as a playable character, although not necessarily, he's not like on your side like he was in Super Mario RPG, he's it's kind of more like you switch between them, like as if they're two different parties, and Mario and Luigi, um, for m most of the, much of the game are actually inside Bowser, and like, um, the game's really kind of silly, honestly, and in a good way, uh, uh, very good sense of humor, I, I feel like this one was a little bit more memorable than, um, than A Partners in Time, this one also has a remake on the 3DS, which I'll get to in a future video, so that's probably the better way to play through this game now. Um, but, um, I definitely had a lot of fun with this one, too. Um, um, yeah, just really solid game. Um, yeah, I feel like RPGs, Mario, and humor and stuff, and, uh, dodging attacks, and, yeah, check it out. Uh, Mario Kart DS. Um, this game was a ton of fun when it first came. I mean, it's still fun now. This is, this is a really great Mario Kart game. Um, it's nothing really terribly fancy. Uh, like, like, af this was after Double Dash, so, like, they went back to one racer, which sounds, like, less impressive, but, like, it just controls really well. It's just like a, like a... They, they just, it's just really well made for the DS. And this was the first Mario Kart game with online play, and so um, that was pretty exciting when that was first a thing. Um, and I spent some time with that. Um, and I guess I guess really like there's not that much to say about it. I mean, it's Mario Kart, and it's like really good. I mean, obviously you can't play online anymore. Um, I would say it's not the best Mario Kart because you know like Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is pretty much the best one they ever made. Um, but um, like if you have a DS, I mean this is still worth picking up in my opinion. It's just a really good Mario Kart. Uh, Mario Party DS. I actually haven't played this one very much. Um, I would like to get together with friends and play this at some point. Um, I believe I could actually do that if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but, um, yeah, I've heard this one's uh, actually pretty good, and I think... I want to say this one actually has a pretty good um, single-player campaign as well, if I remember right. But I will have to find out for myself someday. I couldn't actually tell you. Um, but I have heard good things. Uh, we've got uh, Mario vs. Donkey Kong 2 uh, March of the Minis. So I believe uh, this one, they... Uh, so the first Mario vs. Donkey Kong GBA, um, it kind of felt a lot like a sequel to um, Donkey Kong and the Game Boy. Uh, in this one, they add like this uh, mechanic of like these little minis um, that you have to like guide through the stage, kind of like Lemmings, I guess. Uh, in this one, I actually haven't played too much. You know, I've gotten, I've, I've like tried it out, but like I haven't played it a whole lot. Um, so uh, I definitely will at some point though, because I did like the first Mario and you know, Mario vs. Donkey Kong. I almost said Mario Luigi again. Mario vs. Donkey Kong. Mini Land Mayhem. They didn't add a three, which makes things confusing because people will think this is the first one. Um, this one, uh, I think, I think like they kept going with the Mini Mario uh, uh, feature that they added in the previous game. So I think this one is kind of more of the same. It looks like they added like online play uh, and online features, and that's probably the main draw of this release. Uh, I can't tell you like which one is better or anything, but um, yeah, at some point I will spend more time with these. Uh, we've got. Uh, I'm not exactly going to remember the title of this game, but it's like Meitante Conan and Kindaichi. Um, it's a crossover. This is a crossover game between two, like, um, detective series in Japan. Um, like, I, I guess manga, anime, or, or I don't remember how they originated, but um, popular IPs in Japan that have a crossover here. And, um, you know, it's kind of like murder mystery kind of game where you, like, you know, I'm guessing kind of along the veins of Ace Attorney, but probably quite different. Uh, this one has an English translation patch, which is why I own it, because I, I do intend to try it sometime. I have not tried it yet. Um, but I am interested because I do enjoy this type of game. I, I'm not familiar with the IPs, like the characters that these are from, too much. Like, I mean, I know who Conan is, but like, I don't like know anything about it. I believe, uh, by the way, Detective Conan is known as Case Closed in the few localizations it has had outside of Japan, for whatever that's worth. But um, at some point I will check that out and maybe have more of a solid opinion. Metal Slug 7. This is kind of an interesting choice. Kind of like Contra 4. Like, why have a... Um, kind of interesting to have like a, a main installment to this series on the DS, like a numbered installment. But... Um, 
Metal Slug, uh, I don't like Metal Slug as much as Contra in general, but, um, yeah, at some point I'll give this one a shot and see if this is, like, better than the first six Metal Slugs, or first seven, maybe. Um, but, um, I really like the case that this game comes in. It has, like, a little plastic sleeve that's just, like, shiny and really cool looking. Um, so, I wish I could say more about it, but, you know, it's Metal Slug. It's the kind of game, it's kind of run-and-gun sort of game, like, uh, you can get in these tanks called Metal Slugs and, like, different weapons and rescuing hostages and stuff. And, like, a lot of the games in the series feel very quarter-eater-ish, but... I don't know if maybe that's any different with Seven. Here's Meteos. This was an early DS game, and one of the first—I mean, one of the early ones to come out, and one of the early ones I also got. I got it like basically when it came out. Um, it's a kind of a puzzle game where you—it's a stylus-based puzzle game, and like you—you uh, you can only slide things up and down rather than left and right, and you try to like um, line up, you know, similar colors, and like they start uh, launching, but like they don't launch all the way at first, like. Um, a little hard to explain. It's a lot easier to, like, see it and understand it than for me to explain it. Um, it's pretty good. I like the music in it, too. But it's not, like, super memorable. I haven't, like, really felt much of an urge to revisit this game. I did enjoy it when I when I uh, first got it. But um, I'd say if you're into this type of game, then check it out. Otherwise, it's optional. Uh, here is Mystery Dungeon Sheer and the Wonder. This is actually a, a remake or enhanced port, maybe, of uh, Fushigi no Dungeon 2 for the Super Famicom, which I did actually show off in a previous episode. And that is a really great game, and... Likewise, this is also a very good game. Um, they add a, they, they tweak a lot of things in this. It is not a strictly better version. Um, one thing uh, that I did find disappointing is that the music is definitely worse than the Super Nintendo version. I don't really think there's an excuse for that, and I think that's kind of disappointing. But um, uh, the gameplay, like, they tweaked various things, for better or worse. Um, it's a little easier, I think, uh, than the Super Nintendo version, but still plenty difficult and challenging. Um, and, yeah, I mean, if you like good, challenging, old-school roguelikes, I mean, you can't go wrong with this game. This is kind of a buried gem, in my opinion. Um, underrated, um, and probably, I mean, I can't say how it ranks in, like, the whole Sheeran series, because there's still, like, a few Sheeran the Wanderer games that have not been translated into English, and they're really not playable in Japanese for non-Japanese speakers, so, um, but, uh, this one, you know, I definitely recommend it. It's a good game. Here is, uh, New Super Mario Brothers. This is, uh, well, this was, like, the first, uh, side-scrolling Mario game in many, many years, like, the first one since Mario Land 2 on the Game Boy, I think. Um, and, uh, I didn't think it was as good as the previous games. Like, um, I remember being very hyped for this game and then like, I mean, it was good, but like it didn't, it didn't, the levels like didn't strike me as inspired the way that like other Mario games do. I actually, well, one of the sequels to this, I did like a lot more and was very impressed by, but we will get to that one when, when in a future episode. Um, I mean, it's still, this is still worth playing. I'd say it's a good game. Uh, and there's also a lot of really fun uh, touchscreen mini games on here that you can play with friends and stuff, and um, so it's it's worth picking up for that as well. Um, well, I mean, it's nothing that's going to set the world on fire, but like it, it's cool. There's some cool like bonus stuff in here. It's a solid Mario game. It's nothing like too incredible. Here's Nino Kuni, uh, Wrath of the White Witch. Um, yes, this was originally a DS game, and then it got remade on PS3. And this one is actually more of like a turn-based RPG, whereas um, the one on PS3 was like a little more towards action. It's still like somewhat turn-based, but not like really. Um, and I can't really say too much about this one. I, I did play and really enjoy the PS3 game. Uh, this one I got for really cheap, and it does have an English translation. So at some point I will give this one a whirl and see if, um, see if, uh, you know, just how different it is or, like, you know, how much, I guess, of the charm is still there or what have you. Um, it'll be interesting at some point. Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors. This is the first in what is known as the Zero Escape series. And, um, it's a visual novel type of game, um... Where you're all trapped in a uh, in a in a boat, and you are trying. You, basically, you solve a bunch of puzzles. Uh, like you go through like the kind of these escape rooms, and um, yeah. Well, I mean, the game is heavily story based. It's this one uh, more than even other visual novels feels almost like a book made into a video game because uh, like there's a lot of very like descriptive text, almost like you're reading a book. Um, it's not like the game like describes a lot of stuff. It does like there are visuals and like you see things happen. And there's animations, but like. Um, the game definitely likes to describe things um, with, like, elegant language or descriptive language. Not always elegant. Sometimes it's very violent. But um, this game's got a very uh, good and interesting story and, a, um, you know, a bunch of branching paths to go on. And, like, uh, um, it does that really well. I mean, it can't say too much without spoiling anything. But, um, you know, if you like story-driven games, this is definitely a game that's worth playing. Uh, and the rest of the series, too. Nostalgia. This is a game that a friend gave me. And it's an RPG. And I can't really say too much about it. It seems like possibly kind of an interesting JRPG. At some point, I'll give it a shot and see if, like, you know, I want to stick with it. I have less patience for RPGs than I used to, um, in part because they're so long and I have so much to play. Um, but, you know, I still kind of, I don't want to give up on the genre as a whole. 
And now we're here at one of my favorite games, like, ever. This is Os Totakai Owendan. Os. It's more like Os. They pronounce it Os in the game. Os Totakai Owendan, um, which basically translates to Go Fight Cheer Squad. Um, and basically, um, this is the Japanese equivalent of Elite Beat Agents. This is what Elite Beat Agents was based off of. Um, this is a rhythm game that uses the, st the, the, the uh, stylus and the touchscreen. And it is super duper fun. It's, it's um, I, I just absolutely, like, adore this game. Like, uh, the... The, the, basically you cheer on like these different people in these different predicaments and it kind of plays out like a comic book style. Um, and like how you do in the songs, like kind of affects partially what happens to them. And that's really amusing. And then I, I really like the music a lot and the gameplay is, is really addictive and fun. And, um, it, it's just, it's just a really great game. Like I, I, I this, this, was, this was a game that like, I was really excited to find out about like early in the DS life cycle and was very happy that the DS had no region protection. I imported it like the year it came out, just like a few months after it came out, and didn't regret it. Actually, the uh, only Japanese game I have ever pre-ordered in my life, I believe, if I remember right, at least the, the only regular retail Japanese game, I guess. I don't know. Probably the only Japanese game I've only ever pre-ordered is Astatakai Owendan 2, which came out after Elite Beat Agents, actually. Um, and this one adds a certain uh, quality of life features uh, that were added in Elite Beat Agents, plus even more. Um, and yeah, it's kind of more of the same deal for the most part, like, you know, obviously a new set of songs, but the same basic gameplay, no real, real radical gameplay changes. And that's a good thing because there was nothing broken, so they didn't fix it. And again, I adore this game. I play this game to absolute death and, um, highly recommend it if you like rhythm games at all. Uh, Pack Picks. This is kind of a creative little stylus game, uh, by Namco where like you draw Pac-Mans on the screen to try and eat the ghosts and stuff. I don't know exactly how it works. Um, this was a fairly early DS title as well, but I didn't pick it up back in the day. I got this one much, much later, and I still haven't really spent time with it. But uh, it seems kind of an interesting little creative game. I know it's like not considered like a classic on the DS or anything, but um, uh, seems cool. Seems like kind of unique and worth a shot. Uh, Picross 3D. This is a very cool game. This is a puzzle puzzle game. Uh, obviously, I mean, there's a lot of Picross games, and I'm guessing you're probably familiar with Picross by now, or at least somewhat have a concept of what it is. And this one takes it in... Exactly what the title says. It makes it 3D. Um, you can, like, fl freely rotate around the structure. And um, really, um, it does not feel like a gimmick. It's, like, a really legitimately different and, and cool, enticing way to play Picross. That's, that's um, you know, you can't really find it anywhere else. Um, and there's a sequel on the 3DS as well. Um, and there's tons of content in this game. I've pe pl pl I played it for, like, dozens of hours, and I'm still not done. Um, and I will probably finish it at some point. But um, it's, it's really long. This game's really long. But um, it's fun. Highly recommended. And then here is uh, Picross DS, which is um, a little more basic. This is more like just a basic Picross game, and which is, um, you know, not bad by any means, but it's not terribly exciting. I don't think there's really too much um, to say about this one. Like, I don't think there's that much to make this one stand out among all the other Picross games. At some point, I'll spend some time with it and see if there is, but eh. Planet Puzzle League. This is uh, Tetris Attack slash Pokemon Puzzle League um, in, in the form of a DS game and without any, like, character mascots or anything, um, and I haven't really spent time with this, because, like, I mean, the only kind of real reason to is for the online, I think, like, I don't think there's really that much, like, new here that you can't already get in Tetris Attack and Pokemon Puzzle Challenge, um, or Puzzle League, I'm sorry, Challenge is the Game Boy one, um, so, all right, um, I mean, I, yeah, it's a great game, because, like, I, I love Tetris Attack, it's so good, uh, but, like, this is not, this doesn't seem like a version that, like, I really want to go back to, um, but I kind of want to have it in my collection anyway, because, you know, it's, it's Puzzle League, I love Puzzle League. Basically, or Tetris deck, what panel they pawn, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Plants vs. Zombies, this one comes in like a cool little uh, plastic sleeve as well. And Plants vs. Zombies, I want to say like it started out as a mobile game. I could be wrong though, um, but it has to do with, um, yeah, I don't know exactly how to describe it. I've never like delved into this, but it seems like a interesting kind of like versus style game um, that uh, I would be definitely interested in trying this out with a friend at some point. Um, I'm not sure if this is, like, the best uh, version of Plants vs. Zombies that exists, but I'm imagining the DS touchscreen is probably pretty good for it. And now we're getting to many, many Pokemon games. Uh, here is a Pokemon Pearl. Uh, this one I got when it came out. This is the start of what was called Generation 4, along with Pokemon Diamond. Um, this one made some very cool, relevant, and quality gameplay changes to the series. This was, uh, the first one to go online, um, and this was also, um, the first one to... I mean, I can really go into, like, Pokemon uh, advanced metagame talk here and talk about how this one added the physical special split, as they call it, um, which um, really helps balance out the game well. Like, 
I, I'm not going to explain like the mechanics of Pokemon now, but like basically they made tweaks to the, the formula that were, were really cool. Um, as for the game itself, though, like it's not one of the more memorable Pokemon games for me. Like the campaign itself is not not especially great. Um, and also another problem with this one is that it's very slow. It's like the slowest game in the whole series. Like battles take seemingly forever sometimes, especially if your Pokemon have a lot of HP. Um, they did, and yeah, this is this is the the point of the series where it was the slowest, and they did kind of fix it after that. But I mean, it's still a really good game. Uh, and here's Pokemon Platinum, which is basically per Diamond and Pearl, but better. Um, and like you know, some quality of life improvements. I believe they made it a little faster, although it's still kind of slow. And um, you know, new story elements um, and all that. Like you know, it's one of those third versions of the Pokemon games um, where they kind of make the definitive version like a year after or two years after or whatever. Um, I do recommend it. It's not like the best Pokemon game, but this now we're getting to like three of like the best Pokemon games. Like probably probably my three favorite like in the whole series. Here is uh, Pokemon Soul Silver. Um, Pokemon Silver and Gold and Crystal were already like really really great games in the series, and this one takes like everything good about them and just makes everything better. Like obviously new brain, all new graphics and stuff, um, new gameplay features, like like all the quality of life stuff plus like new stuff, and um, like uh, it's it's it, it, they really like. Um, improved the post game a lot. Like the post game was really cool in Gold Silver Crystal, but felt a little bit thrown in. And this one, they really, they really uh, tweaked it so that it feels a lot more um, legitimate and and uh, worthy of your time. Um, and um, it's it's just really really great. Like this is just about like 2010 to 2011, 2012. Like that's when Pokemon was hitting its peak, and it started with these games. This and Heart Gold. Very happy to have them. Have to have Soul Silver anyway. Uh, then Pokemon Black. The start of Generation Five, as they say, and um, this is a uh, fantastic game. Um, this one has the best storyline of any game in the Pokemon series. Not that this is Pokemon game. I mean, that's not saying a whole lot. The Pokemon games have not had like really great stories, but this one um, has the most interesting story of all of them, and um, a lot of quality of life improvements. Um, and um, like I said before, um, Pokemon Diamond and Pearl were really, really slow. This one fixes that very much. Like if you turn off the animations, the battles go by super fast. Um, and, um, yeah, just very much, I'm very much a fan of this game. Like, there's lots of content, lots of cool stuff to do after the main quest. And, um, this actually has 150 new Pokemon that, like, you will only see them during your initial playthrough. Um, like, you don't, they don't rely on, like, a lot of the old Pokemon in this one like they do in some other games. Um, so, yeah, you get a very new experience with this. Um, and, it, yeah, it's a really great game, highly recommended. And then Black 2 is even better. So instead of trying to make a, like, a spruced up alternate version of black and white, they actually just went ahead and made a sequel, and I think that was better. Um, I think the storyline is a little bit less good than Black and White 1, but everything else is better. Um, they added even more quality of life stuff, I keep saying that, um, and, like, um, just, you know, more new features and more areas, and and um, this one does actually have, like, a mixed Pokedex with, like, old and new Pokemon, and um, triple and rotation battles are a really cool addition to this generation, and you'll actually encounter them in, like, the main quest in this, this, uh, in this one. The only game in the entire series where that is the case. And yeah, these this is probably my favorite Pokemon game of all time. It's really, really, really good. Uh, here's another early DS game, uh, Polarium. Uh, this is a touchscreen kind of puzzle game where you um, use a stylus to like make a line that cannot overlap and try to like make the rows all black or all white. And you can do like a, just like a few different modes. And it's, it's kind of cool. Like it gets really hard, it seems like, really fast. Um, so I never like was able to progress too, too much in it, honestly. Um, but yeah, it's a neat little game. If you like puzzle games, check it out. Uh, here is uh, Professor Layton and the Curious Village. So Professor Layton games are kind of like puzzle books um, if puzzle books had a story attached. That's how I would explain it. Like there's a bunch of different puzzles you come across that are very much what you would find in like a puzzle book that like your grandmother likes. Um, but like, you know, there's a story here with like kind of charming characters and stuff to go along with it. And um, it's fun. Um, it didn't blow me away or anything, but um, cool little game. You know, if you like brain teasers, it's definitely one that's worth checking out. Then Professor Layton in the Diabolical, Diabolical Box is honestly kind of more of the same. I don't really have, like, too much more to say about it. But then they made a Professor Layton and the Unwound Future, which is the best game in the main series, in my opinion. Um, just everything feels better in this one. Um, and the storyline is way better than any of the other games in the series. Um, and, yeah, I really, really enjoyed this. Like, it was, it's worth playing through the first two just to, like, experience this one, honestly. Um, really good game. And then they made Professor Layton and the last last Spectre. And honestly, I was disappointed by this one. This one was made after Unwound Future, and it is not nearly like as good or interesting, in my opinion. It does have this um, additional mode called London Life that I guess some people might like. 
um, but didn't really seem that appealing to me. Uh, the European version got shafted for some reason. They took out the London Life. I don't know why they did that. But, um, yeah, um, I would say, honestly, stop it on one future. I don't think you really... Well, actually, there there are the games on the 3DS, so those might be worth playing, but I don't know. Um, Retro Game Challenge. This is an interesting game. A very unique game where, like, you kind of... You play as, like, this kid who's supposedly, like, in the 1980s, and you literally, as the kid, you play these 8-bit games on your Famicom, I guess, that are... Um, completely ficti fictitious games that are kind of inspired by real life games. Um, and like, there's a quite a variety of them. Um, and like, you know, you try to achieve certain goals in order to, um, progress in the main story. And, um, it's pretty cool. Um, it's not like, not like mind blowingly great or anything, but, um, a uh, neat little unique game. Uh, shame the sequels have not been localized, but, um, yeah, I recommend it if you were a retro game enthusiast for sure. Rhythm Heaven. So I talked about the first one on GBA. This one is also really good. Um, a lot of touchscreen, uh, rhythm-based gameplay here where, like, you'll have some kind of a quirky, silly-looking cartoony thing that you have to do and, like, you know, tap the touchscreen uh, and look to, like, a certain rhythm or, like, swipe up at times and stuff. And just really fun, quirky stuff. Um, I was originally, like, skeptical of this game at first. Like, it didn't seem as good as the first one when I started it up. and then But, but then when I progressed, I, it grew on me, and I, I love it now. It's a good game. Definitely recommend it if you like rhythm stuff. Soma Bringer. I think this is like an action RPG. It's Japanese, but there's an English translation patch, and I haven't really spent the time with it. Um, this game is really cheap, I believe. So, um, yeah, like you see the sticker, there's someone selling it for nine bucks complete. Yeah, that's pretty reasonable. Um, I'll check it out at some point and see if it's like really worth it. Uh, Sonic Colors. Uh, I played Sonic Colors on the Wii. Uh, I thought it was pretty fun. Uh, this is. I'll get to that in a future episode, I guess. Um, this one is different. This is more of like. I mean, obviously, this one doesn't have like. Actually, not obviously, because the DS is a 3D system, but I believe this one only has side-scrolling levels. Um, so it'll be interesting to try this one and see, you know, how it stacks up to the Wii version. I've heard this one is pretty legit, which is why um, I grabbed it. Um, well, actually, it was a gift for me, but, like, and I put it on my, like, my cheap gift list, and somebody got it for me as one of my cheap gifts. Uh, more Sonic games. We've got Sonic Rush and Sonic Rush Adventure, which um, I tend to be, like, I guess hesitant to play, like, post-Genesis Sonic side-scrollers because... I kind of feel like they're just not going to be as good, which is probably true, but, I mean, that, that's a high bar to set, honestly. Um, I've heard something about Sonic Rush having, like, way too many bottomless pits, but I'm, I don't know. At some point, I'll play it for myself and find out, I guess. Uh, here's Soul Bubbles, an obscure little game on the DS that involves, like, using your stylus to guide these uh, bubbles in, uh, to safety, like, with bubble physics. Seems like a neat little kind of touchscreeny, uh, puzzly sort of game. Only at Toys R Us as well. Rip Toys R Us. Um, I haven't played too much, so I can't really say too much in terms of, you know, kind of an opinion. But it seems cool. Star Fox Command. This is weirdly the um, European version because for some reason Amazon was selling European copies. That's kind of weird. Um, but anyway, this is uh, kind of uh, a reimagining, it seems, of Star Fox 2, which originally never came out on Super Nintendo. Uh, where, like, instead of, like, a linear or semi-linear series of levels, you, like, actually control, like... It's kind of like a like a a map where like different stuff is happening. You can go to different areas and try and like uh, push back the enemies or what have you. And um, it has touchscreen controls for better or worse. I can't really tell you because I haven't sat down to try and like learn this game yet. But um, uh, it'll be interesting to try it at some point. I mean, I'm sure I'm not going to like it as much as Star Fox 64 because nothing is as good as Star Fox 64 really. Um, here is Super Mario 64 DS, a launch title, one that I bought the day the DS came out in 2004. Uh, this is a remake of Mario 64 that adds um, some new stuff, um, new mini games for using the touchscreen that are separate from the main game, uh, different playable characters that you now need to switch between at times, and some new stars to get. And um, I enjoyed it a lot. I mean, it's not as good as the original Mario 64 because there's only uh, uh, eight directions on the D-pad, uh, and the 16 directions of the analog stick do matter in controlling Mario in this game. But, I mean, they make it work good enough for this port, um, or remake, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I'd say if you want to uh, experience Mario 64 again in a way that's a little different, it's worth a shot. Uh, here is uh, Super Scribble Knots. This is a fun little game. Uh, I think this is probably considered the best Scribble Knots game, although I'm not really totally sure about that. Um, this was a game where you can uh, basically pull up a, uh, a little notebook thingy and literally type in any word in the English language, plus adjectives if you want, and then you will create whatever you wrote. Uh, and that's really cool. And you use that stuff to like kind of beat the levels and like solve problems and like you know even fight things. There's like even action-oriented levels. And uh, yeah, it's really cool, really unique. 
um, and uh, enjoyed it a lot. And one cool thing about this game is that it has language options. So if you're learning a foreign language like Spanish or Portuguese, or I think French is on here too, you can. Uh, this is a pretty cool way to like you know test out your vocabulary and learn new vocabulary as well. Um, kind of an underrated, overlooked feature of this game. Uh, so I definitely recommend it. Although I guess I probably should like look into see like what is actually the best scribble dance game. Tales of Innocence. This is a mainline Tales game on a handheld, uh, and I played, I want to say, like, two hours of this, and it seemed okay, but just, I didn't feel like continuing with it. Like, it just, it didn't seem like it was doing anything that, like, I haven't seen done better in, like, other Tales games. I just wasn't motivated to keep playing. The characters were okay, but they, they didn't, like, really make me love them, um... Uh, I mean, if you really love the Tales series, it's probably worth checking out. There is an English patch. This is a Japanese, but there's, there's an English patch. Um... Yeah, I I don't know. I'll probably I might sell that one. Uh, Tetris DS. This is uh, often cited as one of the best versions of Tetris ever made. Um, there's a lot of cool modes on here, and um, a bunch of different uh, Nintendo characters are represented with their mostly eight bit sprites. I think, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I mean it's Tetris. I mean, what introduction does Tetris need? Like, you know, this is good. It's Tetris. Here we got. Uh, Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass. Um, this is a game that uh, weirdly uses um, touchscreen controls for movement. Like, Link, you, you do not move Link with the D-pad. You use a touchscreen. I think people act somebody actually like made a uh, patch for this game that lets you use D-pad controls. But anyway, I do, do, do think that it actually works decently well. Um, there's one thing that's uh, rather unique about this game called the Temple of the Ocean King. It's kind of like a central dungeon that you have to keep going back to, and it's mostly stealth-based. And a lot of people don't like it. I actually really enjoyed the Temple of the Ocean King, I'm going to be honest. I did enjoy Phantom Hourglass uh, a good amount. Uh, I wouldn't rank it, like, really high on my list of favorite Zelda games, but it's a good one. And then we have uh, uh, Spirit Tracks. Uh, this one is um, has a little bit of an interesting story twist involving Zelda. I mean, I is it a, is it a spoiler? Yeah, I mean, like, Zelda is basically your companion, and um, you have to, like, use her to help you out. And it's it's uh, there's an amusing little twist in it early in the game. Uh, but I didn't like this one as much as Phantom Hourglass, and there were definitely some moments in here where it felt uh, very obtuse, like the progression seemed like, it seemed very difficult to figure out what to do next. Um, but I mean, it is a cool game, I like the soundtrack, um, it's, it's still, you know, it, there's not many bad Zelda games, I kind of like all of them, if, really. Um, here's uh, the legendary Starfy, we finally got a Starfy game in America after four only in Japan. And this one, actually, is the only one I haven't played. I, I, I played the four in Japanese, and then I didn't play this one that's in English. Uh, and honestly, maybe I'll get rid of this one, because, like, the Starfy games, I mean, they're okay, but, like, they're, they're just okay. Like, I don't, like, cl clamor to go back to them. Um, they're cute. They're amusing. Probably good for kids' games. And, I mean, I mean, they're probably enjoyable for adults, too, but just, like, not anything, like, that's going to blow your mind. Um, like, I'm a little more picky with what I play now. Uh, here is a game that was definitely worth my time, and one that I may go back to someday. It's The World Ends With You. This is a really unique, I guess you call it an RPG, um, and you use the touchscreen and the dual screens uh, to fight in this game in a way that really doesn't fully work on like any other platform. Like This is a game that's very specifically made for the DS. Uh, this game has a very distinct style, and a great soundtrack, and a cool story, and interesting characters. Very unique game, very, very cool. And... Um, yeah, this is, this is a, definitely a standout in the DS library, for sure. This is still probably, like, the main version. There are ports of this game, but this is, like, the version you want to get, I think, on the DS. Um, uh, very unique standout game, and I recommend it wholeheartedly. Uh, here is uh, Tony Hawk's Downhill Jam. Um, this is, I think, different than the console versions and somehow, uh, and I've heard it's good. Like, I've, apparently, like, the DS uh, Tony Hawk games are pretty good for the most part, and um, this one was, like, really cheap, and it's, like... Hey, Hidden Gem, why not? I'll try it out. I like Tony Hawk. And I haven't actually like, spent the time with it yet, but, you know, I will sometime. For now, it sits on my shelf. Uh, Trace Memory. Uh, this game is kind of one of those... Uh, well, it's, it's, it's kind of like a story-driven puzzle game, I guess you'd call it. Um, I, don't, I don't think I would call it a visual novel, but, like, it's more of a... It's more of a like, it has a story, but, like, you're, the focus mainly is solving puzzles. And sometimes you have to really think out of the box to solve the puzzles... I played this game for, like, I want to say, like, three or four hours, and then I just kind of put it down and didn't come back, so I probably would have to start it over. It's kind of neat. Like, if you like puzzle games, it's probably worth a shot. Um, I don't know. Maybe I won't hang on to this one. I don't know. Um, because, like, I just, I didn't play it that much. It didn't, it didn't keep my interest that long. Um, but, uh, you know, it might be worth checking out. It's definitely not a bad game. 
And there's also a sequel on the Wii that only came out in Japan and Europe for some reason. Trauma Center Under the Knife. This is... This one's kind of hard to describe. It's kind of a puzzle game. Basically, you control... You, you perform surgery using the touchscreen in your stylus. And, um... Like, it's not realistic at all, though. It's, it's um... Like, you're, you're... There's a fictional, like, invasive disease in this game, like, that actually involves, like, living creatures invading people's bodies, and you have to, like, perform surgery effectively and get rid of them and kill them and stuff. And, um, it's pretty good. It's got a, it's got a story, too, that's, like, okay, but, like, you know, didn't, didn't set the world on fire for me or anything, but, you know, it's cool. Um, it's a, it's a decent game. Like, I wouldn't say it's a must-play, but, um, it is, it's, it's pretty solid. It spawned a series, so, um, I actually can't really say too much about the sequels. I mean, I, I do have a couple of them, but I haven't really played them, but, um... Uh, there were sequels on the Wii that, you, that well, I will get to those. Um, but um, this one might be worth a shot. If what I just described sounds interesting to you, then I would say check it out. Here is uh, Ultimate Mortal Kombat. This is a port of Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, uh, plus uh, the puzzle combat from Mortal Kombat Deception. And it's ported well. Uh, works well on the DS. One thing that's cool about playing on the DS is that uh, you can see your move list on the top screen, so you don't have to pause the game or anything. You can just look right up and like know what your special moves are and what your fatalities are. And uh, it had online play, which was fun, but, like, the random players I would play online when I played online just would own me every time. And so the online wasn't that fun unless I had a friend to play with. But, um, hey, I mean, if you like Mortal Kombat and you want to have Mortal Kombat on the go, this is a pretty good way to do it. Here is uh, Utachi. This is another touchscreen-based rhythm game. This one by Konami, apparently. A kind of a obscure rhythm game by Konami, a company known for their rhythm games. Seems pretty cool. I haven't really played it too much, so I can't say how it ranks among um, the, the many cool rhythm, rhythm games that I played, but I do do want to spend some time with this one at some point. Here is uh, WarioWare Touched. This is um, the technically the third game of the series, but it came out in America second because Weirdly Twisted came out after this one, despite being made first. They were kind of developed very nearly at the same time. And, like, they decided to localize Twitch, Touch first for some reason, I guess because they wanted to get more DS software out. But anyway, I love this game. Uh, uh, they use uh, the micro games from the first game. I mean, I've already described the first one in the previous episode. Um, but, like, yeah, you use your touch screen. Like, a, a really quick prompt will come out, and you have to do something. will come up, and you have to do something, like, with the stylus most of the time. Yeah, I think pretty much all, all of the time. I think everything in here is stylus. Uh, you have to do something like chop or move or, like, push or whatever. Um and, like, within a few seconds and, like, you know, keep going until you miss a certain number of times. And um, just a lot of fun, a lot of character personality, and, and uh, it's just a very fun game to play. Um, I don't think it's the best WarriorWare game. I don't think it's quite as good as the original, but it's very much worth having a spot in your collection. And then finally we have Yoshi's Island DS. Now, this one um, uh, is... They very much take, like, the look and the gameplay of the original on Super Nintendo, which is not a bad thing, Um but they then they add stuff such as, such as uh, different babies with different abilities, um, and actually, even though I'm a really really big fan of the first Yoshi's Island, uh, I haven't really spent too much time with this one. One thing I will say is disappointing is that the soundtrack seems really bad to me. Like the music did nothing for me when I tried this game, which is unusual for a Nintendo game. Um, but the gameplay is probably fine. Like it has most of the fundamentals that the first one had, and the first one was really good. So at some point, I will spend more time with this and see, um, you know, give my uh, real verdict. Uh, but for now, I can't say too much about it other than it seems good, but not as good. And that is it for my DS collection. And stay tuned because coming up next is going to be the Sony PSP, which is a console I'm actually not that big of a fan of. Uh, but um, I do have games for it, and you will see them next time. Until then, I'm Samurai Sam. Thank you for watching, and have a great rest of your day.